Hello and welcome to Live with Sai. I'll be starting in a minute and we'll be talking about sports governance. Good morning to all our viewers and welcome to Live with Sai. My name is Nandan Kamath and I'll be talking to you today about sports governance. This is a topic that's quite close to my heart and my pitch to you is that you as whatever capacity you are interested in sport in, sports governance matters to you. Just as a brief introduction, my name is Nandan Kamath. I'm a lawyer who works with sports people, sports organizations and many federations as well. I started out as a young cricketer, so I played junior cricket at the state level and at the national level, but eventually went off to law school and pursued a career in law <coughs> and later on have had the pleasure of actually combining both my love for sport as well as my talents in law to work in sports law. Um, I had very, very early influences in sports governance and it was very interesting how I first got introduced to the principles of sports governance in a way probably all of you did too. This was while playing street cricket. So I learned three very, very important principles of sports governance playing cricket on the streets of Bangalore where I grew up. The first principle was that whoever owned the bat got to bat first. Very, very important principle. The second principle was that there are a bunch of people who are around you, that those are your neighbors, and all of their homes have windows. Now, while transparency might be good in sports governance, transparency and having windows isn't particularly great for playing cricket on the streets. This means that all the neighbors are trying to lock you down and telling you not to play on the streets. So people who live in glass houses aren't very good for street cricket. That was the second principle I learned. And the third principle was the most important principle of all. Now we're dealing with the situation where sport has been cancelled all over the world. But it is actually something I got used to quite early and quite young. And that is when my mother called me in to do my homework. So when the, your parent calls you in, all cricket is cancelled. And that was something like force major that is dealt with today as an act of God. That is an act of God, but this is an act of parent, which I think is one level higher. So those were my early lessons in sports governance, which really brought down, you can bring down to the one simple principle, that it is always good to be in power. Whether you own the bat, whether you're the neighbor who can tell kids what to do, or whether you're the parent who can tell kids to come in and do their homework. So this is an important principle I'd like you to keep in mind right from the start. He who holds power makes the rules. But today we're not going to be talking about street cricket or disorganized sport, but we're going to be talking about governance of organized sport. That is the institutions that govern our organized sport, the events that are held, that they hold, and the rules that they make and the rules that govern these events and institutions. So I'd encourage all of you to keep a pen and paper handy. We'll be going through a few different interesting principles. The way I'll split this up is we'll do maybe a half an hour of a lecture and then I'll open up to questions that all of you can ask 
both on Instagram and on Facebook and I'll try and answer them to the best of my abilities. Uh, we'll be dealing with three different concepts in this half an hour. So what is governance? When we want to understand what sports governance is, first we need to understand what is governance of an institution. The second question is, why does it matter to all of us? Why should sports governance matter to all of us? Is it something that someone else does? Something that really doesn't hit me on a day-to-day -day basis? I, I'm interested in it, but I don't really care about it that much. How does one look at this differently and understand that it is something that matters to every single one of us? And the third one is really how using legal structures and framework and institutional frameworks, how do we ensure good governance so that we get the right results in our sports ecosystem? We'll be looking at a few different concepts today. The first and most important one is the need for autonomy of sports bodies. We learn a lot about this. Why should sports bodies be autonomous, free and independent from interference? Why is that the case? Why is it important and why is it important that we protect this autonomy? Second uh, issue that comes up often is what is the difference between interference and accountability? So while you may be autonomous, you may have the freedom to do what you're, you are doing and keep the sports primacy first. At the same time, you are interacting with the state, you're carrying out certain functions. Now, what is accountability? And in what sense are you accountable to people within the country, to athletes, to other stakeholders? And at what point does asking for too much accountability end up in interference? When you address these issues, you have to look at the legal framework and look at the ways in which the political and democratic framework of sports institutions are created, as well as their interfaces with the state whether it comes down to recognition by other sports bodies, recognition by governments, and the basis on which one can exercise this autonomy in a responsible manner, keeping in mind certain universal principles of good governance that come through the Olympic and sports movement, come through uh, the various charters that govern sports activities. So that's how we'll be looking at these sessions. Now, when you look at sports governance, there are a couple of things you one needs to look at. First, what is sport? Uh, sport and physical activity, does it need physical activity? We're not going to go into that topic. It's an interesting topic which keeps coming up. So what is sport and what is not? But today we'll be presuming that people understand what is covered within the realm of sport and what isn't. And we're not going to dispute this issue. But next it comes down to the question of what is governance? Now governance is generally understood to be the, just the frameworks and the cultures within which bodies work. They set policy telling us what is it that they're trying to achieve. They try and deliver these strategic objectives. So once you've set out to go about doing what you want to do, you have to put a plan in place on how to do it. Next, you engage with stakeholders. Now in sport, there are many, many different stakeholders. There might be athletes, coaches, support staff, there's partners, there's broadcasters, there are other bodies. So it really, everyone is pulling in different directions. Sports governance is actually being able to look at the various stakes that the various stakeholders have and balancing it in a manner that takes sport forward. The fourth topic you might want to consider is the monitoring of integrity and performance. So when you talk about institutions, the, the institutions have roles in keeping things sure that the sport you see is real, is not manipulated, is, is being played in under fair conditions where all participants coming in to play are given fair access and are on equal footing where really the human element of sport is given the maximum leeway to, to show, show through. The next part is actually looking at risk. Any organization has to look at risk. It has to evaluate what risks it, it, uh, it has to deal with. It has to manage these risks. And finally, in governance is also reporting back. So telling people what you're doing, remaining accountable to your stakeholders and passing on information on what you're doing and why you're doing it. In essence, the way I like to split up governance and a lot of people ask, so what is, uh, when can you tell whether something is good governance or not good governance? I feel like there are two aspects to sports governance. There are some aspects which are protective and some aspects which are promotional. Now the, the protective elements I would call stationary. That is some things need to be unmoving. The fairness of the game, 
the fact that the game is not manipulated, that it is played within the four corners of the rules. So these are stationary objectives. When you're governing well, you will make sure that the stationary objectives remain stationary. Second are the promotional objectives. When you talk about promotion, you're talking about moving forward and progressing. Now, promotional objectives need dynamism, action, activity. And this is about, for example, developing your athletes, finding the best talent, finding and training coaches, putting the systems together. And these are dynamic and active movements. When you're evaluating whether sports governance is doing well or not, there's a simple question to ask. Is there movement in the promotional activities? And is there a static, strong foundation in the protective activities? If the stationary protective activities are moving and rules are being interpreted through discretion, uh, today rules mean something, tomorrow rules mean something else, you're not really achieving the foundational and stationary objective. Secondly, when you look at the promotional and progressive elements, are those stationary or are those moving? So if you're actually moving forward, you will see a dynamism and activity. So the simple test one can look at is, are the stationary objectives stationary and are the promotional activities dynamic? And very often you might see the opposite. You may see rules not getting enforced fairly and equally and there there's a failure in governance. Equally, where there is dynamism needed, you need talent identification, you need activity, you need movement and none of that is happening. You see static elements of what should actually be dynamic. So this actually comes down to a single simple point. Are good decisions being made? And that is really at the foundation of sports governance. Are people making the right decisions for the right reasons at the right time to take things forward and take forward what needs to be taken forward and keep in check what needs to be kept in check? So that's the basic framework. Talking about, we, we talked a little bit about what sports governance is, but why does it matter? Now, without the solid foundation of sports administration and good governance at the bottom, it is very difficult for sport to achieve its objectives. And I look at twin objectives there for sport. One is of excellence. So moving our human endeavors forward, getting better at sport, taking things forward with the talent that we have within a country. The second is really sports for empowerment, which is really delivering all of the values, the good values that sport has within our community and within our society. Now, when you have good governance, a lot of the other parts of the ecosystem begin to move. You see athletes performing well. You see the talent being identified. You see corporate involvement coming in because the minute there's clarity, there's accountability, there's transparency, there's much more room to, to feel connected, to build partnerships and to take other people along. So you see with good governance actually comes more sponsorships, more corporate involvement, CSR and sport. So when you're doing your own thing and not really considering objectives, you are probably less likely to find support. But the minute people see you're doing good work and you're accountable to them, you're taking them along, the opportunity to build partnerships also increases. You also need events to become platforms for talent to, to operate on and for facilities and infrastructure to grow. So when you look at talent, activities, infrastructure and events, <clears throat> this needs the juggling of a lot of different things and making the right decisions at the right time. At the same time, good governance also enables access to knowledge, access to, in, uh, to the infrastructure of coaching and really builds a character of sports for all that it's not just about elite athletes trying to get to the Olympics or Paralympics, but really that sports is for everyone to enjoy and everyone to participate in. And really those are the, the nation building elements of sport where each of us can get fitter, more active, work within our communities, get to know other people and have shared experiences, but also use the, the value of sport for very specific social change activities. So th this is something that without good governance, it is very difficult to achieve objectives because perhaps good decisions are not being made at the base of the pyramid. We've looked at what is sports governance. We've looked at why it's important. Now within an institutional framework, what are the activities and functions of good governance? What are the things that a good governing body needs to care about? The first of course is athlete welfare and safeguarding. So are you taking care of your athletes and your talent? Are you keeping them safe from danger? It could be from harassment, it could be from physical safety, 
Are you training them in the right way so that they're not getting injured? And at the same time, are you looking after their welfare? Are they uh, in good physical health? Are they in good men mental health? Are they in good economic health? Are they planning for the future? So keeping your talent, not just as performing athletes, but as human beings who have needs outside sporting needs, as well as sporting needs for their progression. Uh, so beyond athlete safety and athlete welfare comes competition integrity. So sports bodies end up being the ones who organize large events. And when you talk about competition integrity, it means many, many different things. So are the rules being enforced properly? Is everyone on the same footing? Are we actually able to trust the records and the timings that come out of this? Are we sure that events are not being manipulated by various different participants? So building trust in the events that actually give us our champions. So beyond athlete welfare, we look at competition integrity. And then we also look at talent identification and development. Are you going out and finding the best talent in the country and giving it a best chance to progress? Fourth comes selection integrity and creation of playing opportunities. Now being uh, the sole body in most instances, and we'll come to that, the, the concept of a monopoly sports body governing sport, you end up being the sole channel through which someone can progress at sport from a junior level to play for India, to play at international tournaments. So the integrity of your selection process after you have actually found and identified talent that is worthy of progression, selection process is being clear, specified well in advance, and that leading to playing opportunities for people within sport and uh, within in India at national events as well as at international events becomes absolutely critical. So you can, uh, we, we've had multiple different selection controversies over the years on who gets to participate at the Olympics. Is it the person who's won the quota? Is it someone who uh, participates in a, in a selection trial? And very often these decisions are made after the event rather than being specified very clearly up front. So at each level, whether it's the sub-junior level, junior level, or as we progress, <coughs> excuse me, we need clarity on how one can progress. And selection protocols and procedures play very, very important roles. The next aspect of uh, uh, sports governance is financial integrity. So lots of funds are raised, lots of grants are given by governments, lots of corporates participate. So do we know how that money is being used? Are we sure it is being used for the right purposes? And the only way one can determine that is when there's integrity and there's transparency on how the finances are being administered. Next comes administrative integrity is are decisions being made in fair, reasonable manners and keeping sort of the public interest of sports governance first beyond the private interests of any governors. Now this is where codes of ethics, uh, issues of conflict of interest, and, and the fairness of, uh, of determination procedures come into play. <coughs> Excuse me. The final uh, issue I'll talk about very briefly is the supervision of member bodies. So beyond doing all of the things that you do as a sports body, you also need to make sure that your members are active and are serving the community. So it's serving their own membership, be it athletes, be it clubs, be it other participants. So making sure in your pyramid, that activity is wholesome, activity is, is happening at a high quality level. <coughs> Excuse me. So the underlying issue we're talking about is good decisions. And how do you get to good decisions? Good decisions are the result of good processes. And when you have good decisions, you can end up with good outcomes. Good decisions do not guarantee good outcomes. But there are a necessary element of good outcomes, whether those outcomes are excellence oriented or they might be empowerment oriented in the way we talked about briefly before. Now the question comes to, we've looked at what is good governance, why does it matter and what are the elements that form part of sports governance and good governance? How do we actually ensure that we have good governance within our frameworks and within our institutions? Now this is a massive challenge. Because the relationship between sports and the national and international laws is actually quite unique and different. It doesn't fit in the same ways in which many of our other institutions would be governed by national and international laws. Sports organizations are actually subject to what is 
uh, in legal parlance known as Lex Sportiva, that is the law that applies to sport, which is really an amalgam of global, supranational, distinct and universal principles that are actually not the laws of states and are not the laws of international institutions. They actually may recognize law as being extremely unique, having its own democratic procedures and requiring to be treated differently. For example, in the, the European Union, in 2009, they had the Treaty of Lisbon, which actually recognized the concept of the specificity of sport. It recognized that the, the requirements, demands and characteristics of sport are actually quite unique and they're so specific that they must be taken into consideration when making any regulation of sports bodies. So that comes up in very interesting ways, for example, in competitive balance, in actually separating uh, men's events and women's events. So it recognizes some forms of discrimination are necessary in sport. It recognizes that other things that might be the subject of competition law uh, objections might be necessary in sport to make sure teams are competitive and, and matches continue to be interesting for all concerned. So to, it's important to understand that sport is different. It is different from the way you would govern any other institution within your country. So it has a parallel legal and democratic process and sports bodies by this me measure get the right to govern that activity that they have the, uh, the, the broad domain uh, exclusivity over. <coughs> how does this happen and how do, pe how do sports bodies gain the right to govern and retain the right to govern. And we look at that very specifically here with the pyramid structure of how sports bodies are, gov are, are uh, set up. So this pyramidal structure starts at the very bottom. So that is the people playing sports. So the players look at this as a pyramidal structure. You have athletes at the very bottom, the clubs and districts that they play for one level above. So they are represented by their clubs and they are members of their clubs. Each of these clubs then becomes a member of a state federation in that particular sport. That state federation in turn is a member of the national sports federation. For example, you could take the swimming federation of India. That is a national federation. At the state level, you will have state swimming federations. Each district or club might have its own membership of the state federation. And each swimmer is actually coming through the system and being a part of a club or a district at the very bottom. Now that National Sports Federation gets a form of exclusivity over the sport of swimming in the country. How does it do that? Because it is actually a member of perhaps a continental body, there could be an Asian Swimming Federation and certainly the IF which is the International Federation at the very top which is sort of the world swimming body FINA. So at a, at a broad level, you're looking at people who are participating, junior athletes, senior athletes at the very bottom, they are members of clubs or districts, districts are members of states, states are, uh, are members of the National Sports Federation and the National Sports Federation is, is recognized not only by the International Federation, but also by the Ministry of Sport and the Indian Olympic Association. So you have both upward and downward recognition as well as sideways recognition by elements of the state. So in this whole setup, you also have the International Olympic Committee, which sets out the charter and the good governance principles. You have the National Olympic Committee in each country. In our country, it's the Indian Olympic Association. And in some cases, you also have state Olympic associations who are affiliates of the Indian Olympic Association. From the governmental side, you have the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, the Department of Sport, as well as the Sports Authority of India. What this pyramidal structure results in that at each tier and each level, every person is governed by only one body at a time. And this is actually a much needed uh, structure because imagine a structure where this did not exist. There could be utter chaos in organizing events, determining who gets to play, who goes out and represents the country. So we recognize that this pyramidal structure results in some forms of monopoly and exclusivity and we recognize that that monopoly and exclusivity is essential to the organized sports ecosystem. So how do we recognize which body has the right to govern and which doesn't? This is through two means. It is both hierarchical recognition in this pyramid as well as peer recognition. So in this pyramid, each superior body recognizes and admits that a body lower in the pyramid 
into its membership based on certain criteria. So for example, FINA, which is the world's uh, swimming body, will recognize the Swimming Federation of India as the federation that has the right to govern swimming within India. It sets certain criteria saying that you have to have a certain number of members, you need to be representative, you need to hold your elections. So its good governance principles are imposed on the member body, which is the Swimming Federation of India which in turn recognizes the state federation saying that so long as you have proper constitutions and run your operations properly, we will recognize that you are exclusive within the state of Karnataka, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, whatever that might be. And that body in turn recognizes its district bodies and clubs and the district bodies and clubs register the athletes and participants into the system. So through this pyramid, the athlete at the very bottom actually has a line of sight right up to the world body through its member organizations. At the same time, you have the notion of peer recognition. That is, there'll be multiple bodies at the same tier level. So the Swimming Federation of India is the body for India. There might be a Swimming Federation for the US. There might be a Swimming Federation for Australia. All of those, when they compete against each other, they're also recognizing each other as, as peers. This is similar at the state level. So you both have hierarchical recognition as well as peer recognition, which eventually ends up in two things like i said at each territory level the body that is in charge the national sports federation the state sports federation is both a monopolist as well as a monopsonist that it is what do i mean by that that it is the only buyer and it is also the only seller so the mono as a monopolist it is the only seller of goods it is the only one that can hold events at the same time it's the monopsonist so it is the only one that can buy so it can be the only one who admits people into events it can be the only one who takes sponsorships for the national team and this is a very important element to why sports governance matters because there are two aspects to monopolies monopolies that do not act at all mean that no no action is happening nobody can do anything and monopolies that abuse their dominant position are overdoing it so finding the right balance for a monopoly or monopsonist is both important from economic outcomes as well as good governance outcomes where the right decisions are being made, not being underdone or overdone. <coughs> so how does this relationship with state actors come into play? And I talked about the concept earlier of autonomy. Why are these bodies autonomous in some ways parallel and separate from, from the sports, uh, from sort of the state actors like like the legislature, lawmakers, administrators. This is quite important because one has to believe that sport has certain principles and objectives that have primacy. That should never be put down at the altar of any political, religious, uh, caste, uh, race, or put any other objective above sport. The purity of sport requires that decisions are made, basis, what is good in sport, what the talent, uh, what talent exists and the integrity of a structure where the primacy and the, the values of sport always come first. What would happen if there's over, overly interfere, uh, there's over too, too much interference from the state? What ends up happening is there could be a serious dilution of this primacy of sports principles and values. It is possible that governmental interests could trump and people will say, let's not send our, our, our best athlete, but we'll send someone we need to send. Or we need to make sure that a certain category of people progress. But So you, are, you may be making suboptimal decisions which do not put sporting principles first. So we all recognize that autonomy of sports bodies is absolutely critical. But autonomy at the same time, like I said, doesn't give you the right to not act at all and doesn't give you the right to abuse your position. So on the continuum between complete autonomy and unwanted interference, which we both, which we all agree is, is important, comes the issue of accountability. So somewhere on that continuum between having no responsibility to the state actors or the public and being overly interfered with and government policy becoming sports policy, uh, being reflected in who gets to go to events and how events are held, comes the notion of accountability. Now the law and state interfaces with these sports organizations at the national level. So all these sports bodies are actually incorporated. So they work with the registrar of companies, they work with the registrar of societies, they work with the registrar of trusts. 
so they are actually in their non sports activities they are governed as any other enterprises would they are also subject to basic national laws the, the indian penal code the the criminal laws laws relating to fraud but what we do not want to interfere with are the aspects where they which are the sporting aspects of who is selecting teams who is organizing events who is choosing what events to hold at the same time the state and and by by that i mean the government of india representing the members of the public recognizes that these bodies and in particular the national sports federations use our national names they actually send our indian teams they use our indian insignia they select national uh, national camp uh, people they they run selection processes on who goes to the olympics who goes to international events they also receive public funding in many instances and they play this role as a monopolist as well as a monopsonist it has long been argued that autonomy means that all of these are private bodies now what has happened over the last 10 15 years is there's been a lot of judicial precedent which has looked at this very very carefully it recognizes that all of these are private bodies and that they must have their autonomy in their in their sporting function but it also recognizes rightly that these private bodies are actually playing public functions as economic monopol monopolists and monopsonists recognizing that there's only one way to go through the system but the fact is that they also using public resources be that funds be that names insignia and they carrying out functions of a public nature even though they might be private bodies so this recognizes that autonomy is not an absolute con uh, concept and autonomy is important but it also must be earned and deserved and that is where the principles of good governance come into play and form the basis on which if you follow the good governance principles you enjoy the right to autonomy that you enjoy the right to govern and you enjoy the right to to go and exercise your monopoly in a responsible manner so what these judicial precedents ended up resulting in is it recognized that it is not just the members of this body that had rights to to uh, to intervene to get uh, legal remedies but that any member of the public could approach the courts and intervene when it came to national sports federations state sports federations it is not just the membership which has rights so it recognized that there's writ jurisdiction that applies to these bodies and when the rights of members of the public in whatever capacity are in, infringed you have the right to get to court and to uh, to to try and uh, exercise your rights against these bodies so this is a, a absolutely critical uh, position and a, a shift that has happened in in uh, what i would call rightly through judicial precedent over the last 15 years or so at the same time all of these bodies are actually in relationship with the the ministry of sport which plays an absolutely critical element so we talked about how the uh, international federation recognizes the national federation but at the same time there's also the the, the ministry of youth affairs and sports which not only funds sport but runs an, an annual recognition process which both respects the autonomy of sports federations but also determines which of these bodies and who deserves to enjoy this autonomy and this monopoly over the uh the sporting ecosystem within the specific discipline so the, the the there's an annual recognition process that the ministry of youth affairs and sports department of sports undertakes each year which checks whether the basic universal principles of good governance and the olympic and sports movement are actually being implemented we also have the national sports development court of india 2011 which forms an a set of administrative directions which talk about our position on what good governance is and which principles will be followed when recognizing derecognizing and maybe re-recognizing our national sports federations and i'll take you that uh, i recognize we're running short of time so i'll take you through these quickly so what does annual recognition depend on it requires these bodies to be incorporated as non-profits to have proper constitutions to at least be in existence for 3 years to have at least two thirds of the states our union territories as their affiliates to run democratic and healthy management practices and importantly to maintain the recognition of the international federation of the asian federation and of the indian olympic association so it like i said this this is peer recognition as well as hierarchical recognition the ministry will recognize you if you are appropriately recognized
<coughs> it also has principles on the age and tenure of office bearers so requiring people to retire at the age of 70 to not hold more than two terms in in a row of four years each uh, these are principles to keep uh, refreshing the ecosystem to get new people in to get fresh ideas and to make sure no one is entrenched so much that they, they, they are making decisions for private reasons rather than in the public interest. They also require or each body to follow these universal principles laid out in the Olympic Charter and beyond. They require what we talked about earlier, financial in integrity, so proper accounting and the display of accounts on their websites. They require impartial and, tra and transparent selection processes. Importantly, they require uh, the, these bodies to resist all political, religious, racial or economic pressures. To, so to truly remain independent from all these pressures and to enjoy their autonomy wholly. It requires the holding of regular dope tests and taking measures against age fraud to maintain integrity of processes. We talked about competition integrity. So making sure the, the appropriate people are competing against each other. They're doing it in a fair manner without unfair means. They also, the, the National Sports Development Code requires each body to have a policy against sexual harassment. So this comes into the category of athlete safeguarding and athlete welfare. It requires each body to comply with the Right to Information Act, which brings in the notion of transparency. It requires the, the regular holding of national championships in all categories, junior, sub-junior, uh, senior, for both men and women. So we talked about when you're a monopoly, Lack of activity is as bad as abusing, uh, abusing dominance. So making sure that the, the basic elements, the, the hygiene of a, of a federation is in play, um, including the voting rights for sports persons, an important element that is coming across all uh, sports governance worldwide is the representation of athletes in decision making. Um, you also have the requirement to hold your AGM uh, on a regular basis so every year to hold your general meeting of all members so that they can come up with their issues and vote on important issues and then finally holding elections as per model election guidelines so holding open and fair election processes where anyone uh, from the membership can stand and can be transparently elected into decision making positions so that's where the the, the, the national sports development code forms the basis on which we uh, are able to evaluate which body is the appropriate national sports federation, which body enjoys the rights to, to govern this vertical discipline right across the country. So just in, in terms of ending, I end with a, with a short segment on understanding really the principles of good governance that come through uh, the National Sports Development Code and the universal principles. So we talked earlier about good governance being about good processes which give rise to good decisions, which can give rise to good outcomes. It is not a guarantee that good decisions always have good sporting outcomes, but they give you a much higher opportunity for good outcomes to result from decision making process. So good processes, good decisions leading to good outcomes. When we talk about the principles and here, if you have pen and paper handy, I'll, I'll request you to take it down. So the, to me, there are six principles. The first is integrity. So integrity in governance, so making sure everything is happening according to the rules, no one is taking unfair advantage. The second is neutrality, that you are actually a neutral decision make maker, you are recognized as a governor that you are a custodian of sport rather than an owner of sport. So you are not an owner and acting in a private manner to further your private interest, but you are actually playing a public role which requires you to be neutral. So you're making the decisions, good decisions for the right reasons, which are not private reasons, but they are reasons of trust and custodianship. So we have integrity, we have neutrality. The third comes fairness. So while you might enforce all your rules, you also have to be fair to various different stakeholders. There are going to be people pulling in different directions. Are you able to balance the various interests and find a position that is fair to all? For example, you'll see that in the last few days over how the uh, the International Olympic Committee has postponed the Olympics. They, they had to take multiple different stakeholders into, uh, uh, into consideration. The host country, Japan, uh, their government, you had, you had to take into consideration the broadcasters and the various sponsors who had already committed and begun their processes. But you also had to look at athlete safety and making sure that athletes' interests were protected as primacy. 
while some people might have had an interest in getting this done in 2020, overall the balancing of interests, it recognized that everyone had to give a little bit when you moved the Olympics to 2021. So that's a good example of fairness in processes. So everyone was consulted, everyone was taken into, uh, into confidence and a process was run which got you to an outcome. The fourth I talk about is accountability. So when you have stakeholders, you recognize that you're not just accountable to your membership and your other uh, and who the people who vote for you, but you're also accountable largely to the public who you are, you are representing in your activities. And you're also accountable to the, the world at large when you're undertaking these public functions. The fifth principle <coughs> is clarity. And clarity is required because very often uh, things are left ambiguous. And while discretion in decision making is important, unbounded discretion is never a good thing. So you want clarity, you want clarity on what rules are going to be followed and then to go and exercise discretion in a, in a responsible and sensible manner within the four bounds of clarity being in place. So if everything is ambiguous, it's very difficult to run organized sport. When is your event going to be held? What is the eligibility criteria? What are the selection processes you're going to be uh, running? So when everyone is clear, when there's clarity, clarity enables planning, clarity enables organization, and when there's planning and organization, you end up with better events, better results and better performances. And the final sixth is transparency. So when you're doing what you're doing, you're also telling the world at large how you're going about making your decisions and why the decisions are being made. So doing things in a transparent manner. So to me, good governance is not just in theory, but in fact, when I say in fact, I say I N F A C T, which is integrity. I neutrality n fairness f accountability a clarity c and transparency t so i n f a c t and that's something good to remember so it's not just about having good governance in theory but good governance in fact so just to end i would just say sports governance really matters to everyone as i talked about from a performance perspective you might be an athlete who cares about progressing at your sport you might be a fan who wants, wants the country to do well at sport and to give ourselves the best shot at doing well at sport, good governance forms the basis. You might be a sponsor, you might be a company that's willing to invest in sport and to use it, sport as a vehicle. Good governance is important to you as well. You could be a partner looking to broadcast sport. So all of these issues of transparency, accountability and taking other people along are equally important to a partner. Now the sports law structure may not guarantee that each one of you has a vote, but it certainly gives each one of us a voice. And that is my parting thought that as we strengthen the pillars of sports governance, many other parts of the sports ecosystem start falling into place. And those with the power make the rules. This is the principle I started with. And my belief is that each one of us has the power and in fact the responsibility to participate in sports governance and in the decision making that takes our sports bodies forward, it takes our sports ecosystem forward and makes each of us not just a spectator but a participant in the Indian sporting journey. So that's where I'll end. I'll look at some of the questions. Happy to engage over the next 15-20 minutes uh, to talk through any of the questions you might have. Let's look at the comments and if there are questions that stand out, I'll look on both uh, Facebook Live as well as uh, So we have a question here saying this is pertaining to your point regarding good outcomes and how it is determined by good decision making and driven by processes. My query is what data and science does and what does it mean to India's sports governance structure to use to identify sportsmen that it will invest in. This is from Aruni Kant Sinha. So certainly the use of data in a responsible manner becomes an important element of governance. So uh, we're actually dealing with at this point in sport more data than we can handle 
So we're getting so much performance data, we're getting uh, data from athletes, we're, we're uh, getting data from, from uh, administrators, from sponsors, viewership data. And this becomes quite, quite important to be able to not only collect this data, but to analyze it in meaningful ways which give us outcomes and results. So we have a, a large uh, sports science core and there's been a significant improvement in our capabilities over the years thanks to the ministry, thanks to many bodies that are actually playing the role in bringing sports science to the fore. Um, so hopefully that answers your question briefly. Uh, we have a question from Gautam Ahuja. What is the objective of the four-year cooling period? So this is a cooling period that all governors have to, to face. So when someone is a, an office bearer in a sports federation, the National Sports Development Court, requires that after two successive periods of four years each, you need to take a break and go away for four years. Now, this is a, a reasonably controversial. Many would argue that it doesn't allow continuity. But at the same time, we need to recognize that we're talking about sports governance and not sports management. We're not talking about the people who are managing the federation, who are the CEO, who are actually in operational control. But these are the people setting policy and making sure that the federation is being run according to proper guidelines and in a transparent manner. So the, the whole uh, concept of tenure limitation is not restricted to sport, although it forms part of the Olympic Charter. There are many different bodies where there's tenure limitation. So for example, the American president can do only two tenures of, of four years each. It recognizes that entrenchment in many ways of body of people actually could result in suboptimal outcomes because what they're looking at is retaining power and maintaining their position for longer periods of time rather than actually making optimal decisions which may make them not necessarily electable but which may be the hard decisions that are required within that sporting uh, paradigm at that point of time. So when you're encouraging people to continuously get re-elected, the principle and the thought is that it could result in suboptimal processes which actually work towards keeping the person in power rather than making the hard and difficult calls which may not be popular but, but which are important calls to make. So when you, you actually force the person to take a break and go away, you are limiting their, their period of impact and give them the time to do the most they can and to bring in actually fresh ideas, fresh blood and new people and new thoughts to governance. So governance is, uh, the, the, while continuity is important, both continuity and actually new ideas, new thoughts and new approaches are important. And as we all actually recognize, younger people are actually much more in touch with what's happening with young athletes. I see that in my own organization. The minute you start actually getting into more administrative positions, you actually uh, may be good at uh, policy making, running events and other things, but you're in some ways divorced from what's happening on the ground. So needing young people in sports organizations, which is really primarily a young person's activity, while it can be for all, is an absolutely critical element. So refreshing governance and bringing new blood in is absolutely critical. Uh, we have a question from Deepa Malik. Hi, Deepa. You say judicial cases should be uh, fast track in case of sports bodies as delay in decision directly impacts growth of sport and the welfare. So absolutely critical point, Deepa. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations uh, uh, on your, your election to the Paralympic Committee of India presidency. Uh, absolutely critical point. What we do not have is proper dispute resolution. So you often see just before events, everyone rushes to the high courts. So what is happening in multiple different countries is trying to build alternative dispute resolution mechanisms for fast tracking. So you have either uh, at a global level, while we have the court of arbitration for sport, it's expensive, not easy to get to. So there's an increasing call to have at a domestic level sports dispute resolution mechanisms. And it's something I did not touch upon my, uh, my, my talk, but absolutely you're right, Deepa. So just understanding that when you're balancing interests, there's going to be conflict that is inevitable and the importance cannot be understated of having high quality sports knowledgeable and fast track mechanisms to to resolve disputes and move ahead so looking at tribunalization of sport although uh, the government isn't in favor necessarily of set, setting up special tribunals for every single activity i think sports uh, requires this in in a reasonably unique way so absolutely critical point thank you deepa for bringing that up i, I i'm sorry i missed it in my talk
So we have a question from Saurish Saha. How can anti-doping education be improved amongst athletes at the grassroots elite level? What can the role of sports lawyers and sports administrators be? So this is a, a question quite close to my heart, Saurish. Uh, I think we all have to do a lot better for our athletes. Uh, there is no uh, excuse for not being educated about issues like anti-doping. But in fact, making this accessible, making it easily understandable, is actually the responsibility of, of young sports lawyers, even senior sports lawyers and, and sports administrators. The role is really to, 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 to deliver knowledge in a manner that is not only really understood but respected. So it's, it's a, uh, certainly something that is close to my heart and would uh, love to involve any young sports lawyer on, on getting more uh, anti-doping training out. Like I said, it is something that is dire need of our country. It's not to say that our, our athletes are undereducated on this, everyone is knowledgeable, but providing timely and understandable and accessible knowledge to, to young people on what the, not only what anti-doping rules are, but also all the various challenges that come around it. So what is the principle and why do we care about anti-doping? So really delivering uh, education in a way that is not just technical in terms of uh, don't take this medication without checking what is the anti-doping code, but really talking about why does it matter, how do we deliver it, how do young people have the right thought process and before they make bad decisions, they actually have the right things in, 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 my, in their mind when making these decisions. So we have five or six minutes left, uh, scrolling through some questions. Um, So uh, a question on uh, Instagram Live, can you elaborate more on how a general fan can help in good governance of his favorite football club apart from voting? I think there are many different ways to get involved uh, with, with even your club. So first of all, turning up and, and having a voice in the stadium. So following your club actively. Two is actually participating may not be in voting, but in very strongly expressing your opinions in a respectful manner. So being there at all points of time in the journey, not being a fair weather friend when your, your club goes down, you can be someone who actually is there in support and is actually providing recommendations, is, is providing uh, ways in which to, to come back. And when things are well, to, to celebrate them along with, with your tribe, uh, with other people who are celebrating along. So you may not have a vote in who gets picked, who doesn't get picked, but your voice is always being heard. So this is something that comes up quite often the voice of the fan is never unheard. And we talked a little bit about analytics and, and understanding of audiences. The amount of effort being spent on just understanding fans and understanding audiences is immense. And if you ever think that your voice doesn't matter, I think you're incredibly mistaken. So being ready to express your voice in a respectful manner to, to explaining why you hold a certain position and not just uh, putting out a position and really interacting in, in many ways through a relationship with your club is the best way you can interact with your club. You may not consider it as, as governance, but it is certainly participatory democracy in that sense. So there are a few questions here on parallel federation. So in some sports, multiple people uh, staking claim to, to being the National Federation and this is a challenge that comes up every now and then and it's something that uh, uh, that the Federation uh, has to deal with both at the International Federation level as well as the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports. This causes a significant challenge and like we talked about a bit, bit earlier, having more than one Federation can cause chaos in the system because people don't know where to go to, whose rules to follow. 
So there is actually a, a clear protocol and process for recognition and de-recognition. And, and, but it is a significant challenge faced by the ministry in determining whether an existing body uh, continues to enjoy recognition or they need to be de-recognized and a new body comes into place. Very often you see splits of an existing body where there's two factions that go away. This is not that different from political parties in many senses. So it's not a challenge unique to sport and it's something we have to deal with on a regular basis. We have to recognize that that sports law and the governance framework takes institutions as they come. So it is not putting into place saying that we are going to recognize these 45 national sports federations. It recognizes them in their place. So it recognizes that some may not be optimal, some may not be, may, may not be operating according to the principles they should be. So it recognizes these limitations, but also recognizes that the, it is essential for sport to grow in the body, in the country, to have a single national sports federation. And when a challenger comes, it evaluates the merits of both bodies and eventually, as soon as possible, tries to find just one of those bodies uh, who has the, the, the right to be the national sports federation. Uh, not an easy question, uh, Rick probably might require a whole session by itself. We have a question from Park Mehta who says, uh, do you believe that the sports governance bill amounts to interference in the sports structure as the IOA has been alleging and it could and could it lead to IOA getting disaffiliated by the IOC? Now it really depends on which form of the bill, how intrusive it is, uh, what uh, what principles it's trying to, to to bring into place. My position on this is that autonomy is critical and uh, we will always want to recognize the autonomy of sports bodies. But at the same time, autonomy has to be earned, which is which by which I mean that basic principles and hygiene has to be followed to deserve your autonomy. Now, uh, uh, there are many different aspects of the National Sports Development Bill. It's, it's uh, not progressed. You have different versions of the National Sports Governance Code. It is easy to say that any uh, accountability amounts to interference, but I believe there is a continuum between accountability and interference. Uh, sorry, between autonomy and interference and accountability form falls somewhere on that. There can be differing interpretations on uh, whether the, the, that something is interference or autonomy, but I, I don't think accountability should ever be brought into question. And uh, uh, some form of a, of a national regulator is there in multiple different countries. The uh, autonomy is on the sporting activities, but on basic hygiene, the, the, the right to act as a monopolist and the ability to really uh, exercise your monopoly, I think should be the subject of more regulation in a thoughtful uh, careful manner which respects that autonomy of the bodies. I think I have time for one last question before I end. So we have a question saying how can technology in integration fuel transparency and delivery of accountability and governance and what are the related challenges involved? This is from Bhavneet Singh. Uh, fascinating question. Uh, I think there's uh, there's an appropriate continuum again between oversharing and appropriate sharing in terms of transparency. We have the the ability now with technology to be much more transparent. So at a basic level of hygiene, the the uh, uh, the sports development code requires you to put up your accounts and other things on websites. But we can go a level deeper and to really build strong management information systems where the public can participate in not just in, uh, not really in decision making on who represents them or not, but in being informed of what's happening with athletes, uh, what are the, the various events and activities. So really using technology to fuel participation and what I, I call, talked about earlier, participatory democracy in sports governance. I think an absolutely crucial point, but at the same time, not everyone needs to know everything about what's happening. There are important confidential and strategic elements within sport which only our athletes and their coaches and their support staff should be talking about. So there is, there, there is an appropriate amount of transparency and then there's an inappropriate amount of transparency one could look to. So I think with that, I'll be ending. I would like to thank the Sports Authority of India for this wonderful opportunity to interact with all of you. I'm available on uh, Twitter as Nandan Kamath, N-A-N-D-A-N-K-A-M-A-T-H. And I'd love to interact with all of you and I'll try my best to answer many of the other questions I haven't had the chance to answer. Thank you again and have a good day.